Welcome to Healthy University, where we'll discuss issues and subjects on how you can live a healthier and more productive life. And now, here's your host for Healthy University, Alan Eisenberg. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Healthy You. This is your host, Alan Eisenberg, and I am so excited today and honored to have Michael Buchanan on the show. You may know Michael. Michael Buchanan co-authored the novel, The Fat Boy Chronicles, which won National Parenting Publications Gold Award and Mom's Choice Award of Excellence and was recently featured in Publishers Weekly. The novel is used by schools around the nation in their anti-bullying and childhood obesity efforts. Buchanan also wrote the screenplay for the feature film, adopted from the book, which I've seen and is wonderful. The movie won multiple awards for its impact, yet hopeful depiction of obese and bullied ninth graders' worlds. Since its release in 2012, millions around the world have seen the film. Doctors, teachers, and parents in every state support both the book and the movie. Buchanan and his co-author, Diane Lang, are guest speakers at schools nationwide, as well as conferences where they discuss the issues of bullying, child obesity, and these issues connecting to academics. The authors won the 2014 New York Champions of Character Award for Literature. The pair also conducts writing screenwriting workshops for middle and high school students. The sequel to The Fat Boy Chronicles is underway, while their next book, Treasure of the Four Lions, is completed. Buchanan is a lead writer for the documentaries, Spiral Bound and Nature Matters, feature length films about the importance of the arts and nature respectively. And I was lucky enough to see Nature Matters uh, at a conference uh, that we both attended recently. Buchanan is a nationally recognized retired math and school teacher. His hobbies include diving in alligator infested rivers, searching for fossils and artifacts, although I don't know about that one, Mike. And his mm-hmm. paintings are in galleries and homes throughout the South. Mike, welcome to the show. It's an honor to have you, and it was an honor uh, to meet you at the conference. It was really kismet, you know, that I had written years ago about the Fat Boy Chronicles and and knew who Michael was and went right up to him and said, hey, you know, let's talk. And and now we're here doing a show. So welcome. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. And it was. It's always... uh... You know, when you write a book, you never know if anybody other than mom's going to read it. And so and then when it became a movie uh, to have somebody walk up and go, hey, I read your book. I saw your movie. And it, it always just kind of catches me off guard. I'm like, oh, well, that's cool. Yeah. And, uh, and then when they have good things to say, that's even better, you know. Well, and the really and, cool uh, part for me, you know, is 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 you, your laid back nature that we could talk that, you know, I, I've run into people who are approachable, not approachable. And and not really, you know, they they do things, but they're not really doing it out of the care and concern that we all have. And, you know, you just blew me away. You just um, not only with what what you've done with Fat Boy Chronicles, but the work you do with your documentaries. Um, Nature Matters was incredible just to the folks in the audience uh, and tell me when I'm wrong about this. Uh, it's about really inner, an inner city school group um, who a, a few of the kids join join in to go to uh, Yosemite and they experience what it means to have to not only depend on each other but also be out of that environment that the cities bring and see the environment that is the beautiful world we live in and it changed them, right? Oh, definitely. It was uh, yeah, it was inner city kids who had never really ventured outside of the inner city, and so uh, and they're teenagers and they had never seen a waterfall. They'd probably never seen a a hawk flying by or uh, seen a creek that were in which the water wasn't terribly polluted, you know. And so it's one of those situations where you don't know what you don't know. And when we put them outside in nature. Uh, then their stresses went away and they became a team and and it changed them all to the point where some of them came back from the trip. It was to Yellowstone, not Yosemite. Oh, sorry, and, Yellowstone. Yeah, no, it was a Y. <laughs> and it's one of those cool places out there. And uh, and some of them changed their uh, 
class schedules so they could take more biology and things like that and go mm -hmm. to college and become, uh, you know, work with outdoor kind of, um, you know, careers. And so they were just enthralled with the great outdoors that they never really knew anything about. And, and uh, so between that and, and the other film, the one you mentioned about the arts, there's mm -hmm. so many things that make a difference in people's lives. But for kids, they're kind of at the mercy of what adults uh, expose to them. And so if kids are never taken to the art gallery, then they don't, they're not going to appreciate it. If they're, if they never take an art class, they're not going to ever tap into their creative side. If they don't go for a hike in the woods in unstructured nature, then they're never going to understand what it's like to sit and be quiet and have only your thoughts with you and not noises and all this other stuff that mankind brings with him. And, uh, yeah. so, you know, so I'm so glad you got to see the film. We, we love, uh, we love the nature matters one and think it has a very, uh, powerful message. Yeah. And I think the thing, the thing that touched me the most, and again, it, it was shown at a bullying conference and, uh, is that it was a very diverse group of people. Probably I, if I had to harbor a guess in an inner city, we're not were not most of the the teens were not people that would have associated otherwise, and they got together and realized who they who each of them was and that they weren't this preconceived notion of of what was in their minds. Did I mean that's what came out to me? Yeah, you know that that the their the ability to see outside of color you know, preconceived right. ideas of what people are like and, and, and really once you have to depend on someone, um, how that changes you, uh, internally to really realize the better, the betterment of the world that you offer. And, right. and I think that's what these teens got. And, uh, and I think that does make a difference in the, in the conversation about bullying, because in many cases, I think it's what we don't know about people's cultures, people's feelings, people's ideals that that make us dislike them with some bias. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. No, it's always easy to bully the stranger. Uh, right. You know, and so, I mean, sometimes bullying takes place within a group, but, but once you get to know somebody and you understand uh, their life a little bit, and maybe why, how they struggle and how their, their life overlaps with yours, then it's hard to, to make that person a victim of your taunts. And so the, uh, the thing of taking all the kids out into nature and all that, they, like you say, they didn't know each other until then. And some of them did a little bit, but for the most part, no. And, but when they were immersed in each other's worlds for, uh, you know, 24 seven for a few days, then those th that group will always have that moment and they will always be family and they will always have each other's back. And uh, whether they see each other on a regular basis or not, it's, it's one of those things where the, that person will always mean something to them. And like you say, if, it's, if they got to be friends with somebody of a different race, religion, culture, whatever the case, then the next person they meet who fits that template they will see them in a different light because I mm -hmm. always remember that person that that they got to know just by sitting on a rock watching the the waterfall in Yellowstone or whatever. Yep, exactly. Yeah, um, I do want to go back to your book, uh, The Fat Boy Chronicles, yeah. because I I have I have a really interesting question for you. Yeah. Um, the name's kind of tough, you know. How did you decide like you were going to just be out there with that name? Like, say, this is about a child who's obese. Right. It's his story. And how was that responded to? Like, did, first of all, what was your debate in your head about the name? And then how, how did you feel it was responded to? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a good question, because we did kind of uh, struggle with the name a little bit. And uh, the book is told through uh, Jimmy Winterpock's journal for ninth grade English class. And in the entries, he lets the teacher read. It's just funny high school life. And I'm a former teacher, and so is Diane. And so we and we know the world of ninth graders, which they're quite entertaining. They do about mm. 24 things a day that you could write a book about or at least put in a book. <laughs> and uh, and so, but then the entries that he did not want the teacher to read that contained the more difficult days of being picked on and how him and his buddy do some knucklehead things, 
uh, then those those were at the top of those. It would say, "Please don't read this page," and the te- and he would fold them down, and the teacher would not read those, uh, at least supposedly. Mm-hmm. And so initially, the book was going to be called "Please Don't Read This Page." Mm. And but I was in a writer's group at the time, and you know you kind of meet one, you know once every week or so, and uh, you read things to people and they give feedback. And for a long time after that, uh, many times. I would see somebody and go, oh, how's that uh, book about the fat boy going? How's the fat boy book? Mm-hmm. How's the fat boy book going? Mm-hmm. And so it kind of hit a nerve, and I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. And uh, and so since it was told as a journal, then we just came up with the Fat Boy Chronicles and kind of tried it out, and people thought it was kind of catchy. And But we did have some parents that said, oh, my gosh, I can't give my kid a book that has the word fat in it. Mm-hmm. And so a good friend of mine is uh, – head of pediatrics at Emory and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, like the, the big hospital for kids here in Atlanta and actually, you know, around the nation. And I was asking him because he deals with kids that have obesity issues. And he said that uh, the thing to do is just call it like it is. He said, if you're always dancing around the subject and you never really come out and say, OK, we've got a problem to come out, kind of talk about here that, uh, that you're 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 never really hitting it head on. You're always just dancing around it. Mm-hmm. And he said, leave the word fat in there. And if it offends a few people, that's OK. But he said, that's what the problem is. He mm-hmm. said, you know, so just let it be out there. And uh, and number one, it's a it immediately lets people know what the book's about. Oh, yeah. And, and so, you know, in that sense, it's, it's good. And what what was really interesting was when we were casting for the movie, yeah. Uh, the kid who was playing the lead role just happened to be the kid on the cover of the book. But actually, when we were casting for the book cover, let me back up. We sent out notices to all the agencies in Atlanta and said, we need somebody to be on a, a boy to be on the cover of a book called The Fat Boy Chronicles. And the only kid that responded was the one who got it. And he was great for it. Because a lot, most of them were saying, oh, we don't want to be on the cover of a book that has the word fat in it. Because all our actors and all our models are just perfect little, you know, people who are, you know, skinny as a rail and everything that's supposedly wonderful in America about, you know, the the image of what's good. And, uh, yeah. yeah, and so it was kind of, so right off the bat, we had to deal with that. But I'm glad we stuck with the Fat Boy Chronicles because uh, people recognize that name uh, yep. much more than I think they would if it was "Please don't read this page," which is sounds you know cute, but just doesn't have the same uh, same impact. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I will I will tell you that I immediately know who, knew who you were. I mean, that definitely when I when I saw it, read it saw the movie. I mean, it, it all stuck with me in that, in that very deep sense. Uh-huh. And, uh, so what, when the story came out, do you remember what the response was? How did, how did it, how did it evolve, um, from there? Well, the response was overwhelming. I mean, you know, I, we were touring all around for, you know, a good year or so. I mean, and even though the book came out in 2010, it's been that long. I still get requests to speak at schools where they're reading the book and and all that. And and so, uh, like I said earlier, you just, you you know, you write something, you don't really know how it's going to hit a nerve or if it will. And uh, but the first people that loved it uh, was the publisher. I mean, Mm -hmm. I remember the the owner of the company called me up and said, we absolutely love this book. And so I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. And so. uh, and then once it got into schools and things like that, then the feedback we got from kids, especially, was uh, just very humbling. And whether, you know, it was great to get the feedback from the adults and the reviews and all that kind of stuff. And whether it was school superintendents or, you know, people way up the food chain or whatever, the response we got from kids is what really touched us in so many ways because Diane and I, like I said, are both former teachers. And so to have a kid come up and say, your book made a difference in my life. I now am no longer a cutter. I now am no longer a bystander. I'm going to step in and help people 
or when they say, uh, you know, I was a bully and I never knew what it, I never knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so we've had kids from fifth grade up to 70 year old folks uh, tell us how much it impacted them and how it will change their behavior. You know, and I mean, some of the, one of the, the best ones was early on, I was given a talk in North Carolina where all the kids read the book in this one middle school and I'm going there to give a talk and the, and the principal comes up and she's telling me this story and she's, and she's already teared up as she's beginning. And she said, this little kid came up to her and he said, Miss Johnson, I want to tell you of what happened to me a couple of days ago. And she said, what was it, Billy? And, uh, he said, uh, well, you know, Scott's always picking on me. This she said this kid was kind of small with glasses. And, um, he said, no, Scott's always picking on me. And she said, yeah, no, Billy, that's not good. And, uh, and so he said, but a couple of days ago, he started in on me again. And I just stopped and looked at him and I said, Hey, Scott, aren't you reading the same book I am? Mm-hmm. And, He said, and Scott thought about it, and he stood there and he said, yes, I am. And he said, it won't happen again. I'm sorry. And by the end of that, this principal is like crying, and she's got me all worked up. And then I can go give a talk, you know, after that. And and so whether it was that or college kids, you know, it's used, the the book's used in a lot of universities that use it for people that are going to be teachers. And sometimes I go talk to them and, and, this one time this football player came up and, uh, and he goes, I read your book. And I was like, okay. And, uh, and he said, yeah, I got by halfway done with it. And I put it down and, uh, I got on Facebook and I found this kid I went to high school with. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. And he said, and I apologize for how I treated him. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, things like that just continually have happened in this journey. And so, uh, it has just been, astounding and overwhelming and and uh you know we're just we're thrilled that it's it's been able to help folks young and old yeah and 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 i tell you i've read i've read a lot of you know books written for that age group and and seen movies and and some of the programs and and the thing that really you did in the fat boy chronicles that i think people may not you know, quite get is even within the title, but even within the book, there there's humor. I mean, your main character is, you know, is and and the book itself. I always, I always harken back to my childhood and with Judy Bloom, she would write about some serious topics, but in a way that was accessible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's not easy. I always tell people like it's not easy. You know, I I I intended for my second book to be written, you know, for middle school, but it's definitely older than that. It's definitely, you know, just because of the situations, uh, it's more high school and above. And it's very hard to write to just that level, you know, and and that's a very touchy level. We all know middle school is sort of that really horrible time in everybody's life. And uh and to write to it and to use humor as part of the delivery mechanism. How, how did, how do you go about the creative process? How do you, how did you like think about it in terms of what you knew as a teacher and as, as an expert in the area? Well, uh, I mean, having been a teacher, you know, from being Diane, I mean, that, that helped immensely because you just, you know, you, you see that world all, all the time and it just becomes a part of you. And somebody told me one time, a fellow teacher, he said, I have the odd ability to assume the age of whoever I'm hanging out with. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think being able to, you know, having to write as Jimmy being a ninth grader, that uh, I could jump into his head kind of quick because I remembered those days. But also, uh, I guess if you're doing teaching correctly, then you have empathy mm-hmm. for kids. And it's not just standing up there and giving out information. It's about, hey, what's inside that kid's head? And so I'd already kind of done that just by uh, trying to be a good teacher. And so when it came time to write Jimmy's from Jimmy's point of view, then it was uh, it wasn't easy. But I had already kind of been there. And there was one kid that I used to teach who did sit in the back of the room and who was overweight and would come in and sit by the back door 
and try to be invisible. Mm -hmm. And as I was writing, you know, I was still teaching when Diane and I first started writing on it. <clears throat> and, um, uh, and I would try to picture what was Patrick's day like, you know, what was he experiencing in the hour before my class and in the hallway afterward and in the locker room and all that. And, uh, and so things like that, you know, I mean, if you're going to write honestly and so that it comes off the page real, then you have to become that character. You can't stand over here and write about him. You got to be them. And so when it's fun times, it's funny. You know, mm -hmm. Diane and I are writing these things and it's something that the reader finds entertaining. You know, we're sitting there laughing as we're mm -hmm. writing. Like, mm -hmm. it's kind of funny. And uh, and then when it's the difficult times that Jimmy has to deal with, then it bothers us. And so if, if it doesn't, if you don't put emotion into your creativity, nobody's going to feel emotion coming out of it. Yeah. And so that's uh, that's one of the things that, you know, I had to learn about writing and. And it makes writing very difficult, but it but that's what makes it rewarding too. Well, yeah, I mean, I'll just, I just share a quick story, sort of similar to me to what you're saying, but in a different vein. That when I was writing Crossing the Line, I knew I was going to be writing about some very tough subjects like you know school violence and suicide, and I knew there was an upcoming very difficult piece of writing. And I'd already worked it all out sort of in my mind. But I, I, I think you probably find as you start typing, things change very rapidly, you know, and, and, and develop uh, differently than you thought. And I just remember I was writing and I was crying and I was writing and I was crying. And, and you know, the, the only issue I have is that people come up to me and they go, wow, you know, this particular part of the book was just so much more powerful, I guess, in, in some ways than some of the other parts. Right. And it was just, there was so much emotion coming off of me to the page. I felt like I'd never had that sort of author experience where I just, it was, it was very difficult to write yet had to be written type stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, we got to take a quick break, and when we come back, I'd like to talk more about the you know the whole holistic area of bullying that you've discovered through your journey, and uh, what what we might be able to do about it. Sounds great. Okay, so if you hold on, we'll be right back with more healthy you. Welcome back to Healthy You. This is Alan Eisenberg, and I'm here with Mike Buchanan, who is the author of The Fat Boy Chronicles and also uh, the screenwriter for the movie, and is also a documentary filmmaker and likes to dive with alligators, which, uh, Mike, you got you, you to gotta explain more of that at some point, but I, yeah. I don't know if there's alligator water. I'm not, I'm not touching it if, if alligators are in the water. But. Yeah, well, luckily the water's kind of dark, so yeah, so you don't actually see us, them. but we don't see them. I see them on top, and but we're <laughs> once we get down to the bottom, we're looking for fossils and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. but I, it's like I say, everybody has to have something that they do that's exciting, right? You know, there, there's the challenge of it. I'm sure in that world. Oh, yeah. My mom would uh, prefer that I do something a little less exciting. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it has its moments where our motto kind of became if we uh, live through it, then we had a good time. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, there's, there's always that. And then, you know, life, life's short. You might as well enjoy it, right? You know, if you yeah. enjoy doing it, do it. So anyway, yep. I, I wanted, I think the book's great and the movie and all that you're doing. But I know you're getting to see and, and feel, you know, the atmosphere of bullying today. What's your take on, on what you're seeing? Uh, well, I'm, you know, the bullying issue kind of changed, I think, when technology became a part of the picture. And so that that gave rise to, you know, online bullying and anonymous bullying and the pack mentality and, and all of these things that have come about since the Internet. So for all the good things that the Internet's brought to us, then it has definitely changed the social interaction world for kids. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's one of the things that needs to be addressed. What I what I've really learned, you know, when, when you write a book, well, I'll, let me back up and say this. Diane and I just wrote a story. It was inspired by a real kid who came up to us and said, you need to write my story. Well, he had been uh, it was at a book signing for another book and he had been the overweight picked on kid in an elementary and middle school. And he told us how he decided to lose weight. And it kind of changed his world. But he said he in middle school, especially he had really dark days where he had contemplated suicide and all these things. And uh, so we just kind of wrote his story, not realizing that this kid, Doug, was kind of the template for who gets picked on in school. Mm. You know, the most uh, the overweight kid is 60 percent more bullied than anybody else in the school. And so but we just wrote a story. And so then when it got published and all that, then the, the it became a favorite of anti-bullying efforts. And so we kind of got shoved into anti-bullying world or bullying world, whichever you want to call it, and childhood obesity world mm-hmm. this was uh, an overweight kid. And so uh, we had to do be quick studies on how to address this, because as you know, when you write a book, then you are instantly an expert on that, even if the book is fiction. And so people thought that we would be able to solve every bullying problem in every school. And uh, so we paid attention to what worked and what didn't and what the issues were. And I think having been teachers, we focused on what works for kids. And so I think one of the biggest problems in let's fix bullying world is that so much of it is targeted at the adults. And a lot of it is superficial things like we're going to hang a, a no bully zone sign in the yeah. hall and we're going to we're going to have all these things that really don't develop empathy and that don't give a kid a reason to know how it impact, how their bullying changes the life of somebody forever. And, uh, and so to me, that's one of the biggest things is a lot of the programs are geared toward the adults, hoping that the adults then in the school buy in and they go back and, and spread the word. And, uh, yeah. and what we've tried to do, and I think what you do in your mm-hmm. efforts, from what I understand, is that you try to reach the kids. Because the yeah. kids are the ones that are going to make the change in a school, and or in or whatever the environment is. And yeah. But you know, if bullying takes place eighty five percent of the time outside of the view of an adult, then if all our efforts are at the teachers and the parents and the administrators, then we're talking to the wrong crowd. Well, well, and I also say that it's it's a holistic issue. You can't just bring in someone to speak to the adults and expect change. You can't just bring in, and this is the one that I really struggle with, a speaker for the kids, like, don't bully. You know, bullying's bad. Be a bystander. <laughs> you know, all these messages are good. Right. The problem is it has to be holistic. It has to be what, what I talk about in, in sort of in the bullying recovery world that I work in, and also in what I talk about is the culture. So whether it's a business, whether it's a school, whether it's home, what's the culture? You know, what culture are you ha, has been created and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable? And how do you handle this and how do you handle that? Because when you're first, in my opinion, when you're not sy- systematic with 
how you handle things. This kid you like, so you treated him differently. This kid you didn't. You know, it's kind of like that 13 Reasons Why. I don't know if you saw that, but, oh, he's a star athlete. We can't do anything to him, you know. Right. And, you know, that was the telling in that story. But I, I agree. I think, you know, one of two things have happened. You know, technology has caused a, a huge lack of understanding how to communicate for children in particular you know, the ways that they, they can communicate, particularly verbally or or understanding, you know, communication in a certain way. You know, they're all they're all busy typing and the thing about and I've always said this even about email, it my and I'm sure you've had this experience where your email was so misread, like it wasn't angry, but someone took it as angry. Right. Or took it as a, a threat or took it as whatever because that's how they read it versus what you would have said to them had you said it. And I think that's interesting. So so kind of going back, you know, studies have shown this drop in empathy the last 20 years, and I, I do think technology is a big piece of that. But I also think we're so busy teaching everything, but, again, you know, as you know, the, the arts gets thrown to the side. The things that create empathy, that, that empathy is a taught thing. You being a math teacher might understand, like, math is math. You know, this yeah. is how you do it. But it's taught, right? You know, you have to teach the proper way to do it. That's what yeah. I remember about math. Although there's creative math today, I understand. But um, it's the same with empathy. You know, you, you don't just, you're not just born with it. You you may have it, and you it has to be cultivated. Um, but But you can't expect someone to be empathetic just because... Uh, you want you want them to be right. It has to be something you you focus on through. I mean, I think through great programs like plays and theater and music and and reading and all of these ways help cultivate. It's like you said, you know that you know some kid reads your book, some ch- young person reads your book, and it it causes action, empathetic action. Right? I'm sorry. They call the the, the kid they picked on, and they say, I'm sorry. Yeah, that that yeah. comes from your what you did as an author to create to create that understanding to that person. Right. I mean, and, and, that, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's that well, I was going to say that's a, you know, what I've learned is that's the value in the book, in the movie, especially the book, is that it's told first person. So you are Jimmy. So, mm-hmm. you know, like you say, uh, somebody can go in and talk to the kids about, you know, don't bully for 30 minutes and all that. And that's great. And a lot of times those programs are really good. And, uh, but when you read a book, when you, when you, and it's stretched out over a week or two and you're in that kid's head and you are the victim and you see it through his eyes, then it changes everything. And, uh, and so that's why, you know, I've, I've come to slowly learn that, that literature if chosen correctly and film and movies can make a difference in what you're talking about in uh, teaching empathy, because mm-hmm. empathy mm-hmm. it's it's part of our wiring as humans, I think. But it has to be brought out, just like our creativity or whatever it is that's innate with us. It still has to be fostered and and shown a path forward. And so, behavior uh, is learned. And mm-hmm. no kid is born a bully. No kid is born to be whatever it's maybe it's in there a little bit but i every kid that's a bully is shown how to be a bully whether Mm -hmm. it's by what they see at home by what they see in their peer groups by what they see on tv uh in the media whatever the case may be uh and so if we can show kids enough uh cases of here's here's really how you treat people then uh, then it, I think it can make a big difference. And so parents and churches and teachers are all part of this solution in how they treat each other. Yeah. And that's and that's what I keep saying. You're always watching. Yeah. And I keep saying it's it's really you know, if we want to avoid young young people going to prison or going to juvenile over these issues, then it's going to be community. Yeah. The community is going to have to work together. If you don't, the law will be happy to intervene. But I, I, I can't stand watching really young people go to, to juvenile because that's it. I mean, that's 
that's kind of the beginning of the end. You know, yeah, it's the, tough. The, road, the road's not going to be easy to get out of that uh-huh. and getting kicked out of school. And we, we've seen all sorts of terrible things in our area where, you know, boys get kicked out or girls get kicked out of school for doing the one violation. The the other thing that doesn't work is the, the, uh, um, the no, you know, no strikes idea. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they get expelled. They go to another school and then a lot of them, you know, take their lives or, or their lives are ruined. You know, they're just, right. they feel, um, so I agree. And the other thing that is important is that, you know, sympathy is not empathy, you know? Right. So again, sympathy is something we have by nature. You know, we tend to feel sympathetic towards some something, but empathy is truly a learned trait and has to be experienced either through media, movies, or your own life. Right. And it's so important. It, it's you know, I, I I wish there was a class on it at every school. <laughs> I wish you know it was it, just taught. Yeah. On that note, one of the probably the best thing that I've seen schools do in my touring around are uh, mentoring programs utilizing athletes because mm-hmm. in a school, middle school and up, the kids who are the high profile athletes are whether they should be or not, are the most admired kids in the school, sure. especially in high school. And so uh, there's been schools in which they will say to the varsity athletes, if you are going to represent our school. We expect you to have enough character to be a mentor for somebody who might need one. And at first, the the players will moan and groan, and then they're paired up with somebody who might not have one friend in that school. And and it's not like uh, you know every day from nine o'clock to nine ten. It's just like that kid is. He can call you and talk to you anytime that he might need to. And invariably, what the coaches have said is that uh, the kid at first, the, the player will say, Coach, oh, my God, why are we doing this? And then a few weeks later, they're going, you know, this is kind of cool. Because yeah. all of a sudden, they, they see the world through that kid's eyes. Uh, and they understand what how they can make a difference in somebody's life by just being who they are. Yeah. And, uh, and so that that is probably as much as anything, I think, is what if schools wanted to make a difference. It doesn't cost a nickel. And just to establish mentoring programs, I think, would be over the top great and over time change the atmosphere. Because I've always felt that in all the years I taught high school, that the school climate, the atmosphere of a school was defined as much, if not more so, by the uh, upperclassmen in a school by sure. anybody else, adults included. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, no, I, I would agree a hundred percent. And there's, you know, there's some really great heartwarming stories out there where this this is successful. I think one of them I remember was, uh, you know, they they had a boy with Down syndrome, and he would suit up. You know, they had him part of the team. He would suit up in the last game he he played, um, and just one, you know, one play. And I think all the other kids, both teams, you know, they let him get the touchdown or whatever. Right. And it changed his life. It changed all their lives. You know, I think it was this great moment and, you know, it made the news finally. And I was like, that that's it. You know, that's all you're talking about. Something as simple as that. Yeah. You know, just they a never slight action. Person the same again. Yeah. For that's five the, minutes, you did something. Be, yeah. It'll always be there. Yeah. And, and, and that they can affect so many lives. And, and again, it, it works both ways, right? You know, so you, can, you can affect it this way or you can affect it that way, unfortunately. Yeah, true. I mean, yeah, you see so many cases where uh, athletes are, you know, doing the wrong thing. Yeah. And, uh, and it, but it's so simple to turn that around. But that that is a case where it takes adult leadership, where you've got to say, hey, yeah. guys, we're going to do this. And you might not like it right now, but but I believe in it. And yeah. you've got a coach or a principal or whatever who's strong enough to uh, to kind of push, then everybody benefits. I mean, I've always felt, you know, it's so easy to be a teacher for the kids who are great and who sit in the front and answer all the questions oh, yeah, and, and who are the, you know, the little superstars and all that. And it takes a lot of effort to be a teacher, a coach, an administrator for that kid who might not have one friend in the school who dreads getting up every morning and getting on the bus, you know, that's the kid you need to be there for. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
If you mm-hmm. can do that, then everything else is a piece of cake. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's tough. I mean, I, I, I get it. You know, I get the idea that we're, we're wired for success, right? We're wired for this idea that we, we want to see the kids succeed. And at some point, you know, you, you can't give up on people. You know, we, it, it, we know this. We know that, you know, not every kid at, at 12 is where, where they're going to be when they're 16. But if you give up on them, they're never going to. You're never going to get there. I mean, I didn't get my first A until I was probably 15. So, yep. so yeah, it took, it took a lot. And it was in math, you'll be happy to know. So there you go. Once you I got, got into algebra, I understood everything. Was like, yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you got you know, to have somebody that's, you know, kind of cheering for you a little bit. You know, Diane is uh, still teaching in inner city schools in Cincinnati now, and, and the kids mm-hmm. just love her. And yeah. uh, it's because she's always they know that she is on their side. And, uh, and so, you know, this not accidental that we were able to write a book that, uh, that kids can gain from Mm -hmm. and, uh, can see what it's like to be, you know, that kid who struggles. And so, uh, you know, it's been a pretty, uh, pretty interesting journey. And, you know, like I'm saying, we're working on the sequel, and, you know, the first one was Jimmy's story, and the one we're working on now is Sable's journal. There's yeah, yeah. In that, you know, she's a cutter and she has issues and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. This one's a it's, lot darker. It's a lot yeah. harder to write. Yeah, so. well, if you if you need any advice. So, you know, when, when I were crossing the line, I, I did four different perspectives. So it was flipping, you know, first-person perspective. And uh, it was tough. It was tough. Um it was easy to write some characters and it was really hard to write other ones right? because I was writing about bullies and what was going on with them. I was writing about, you know, again, self harmers and, and somebody who was got involved in, in bad things because they wanted to be liked and all, all of these very complex things. And, and it was hard to jump. Um, so I'll look forward to that. I'll look forward to, to seeing that. I think it's important. I think it's important that, that understanding because, you know, at least in, in my book, you, you had to understand why she was self-harming and, and it wasn't necessarily always the bullying. There was a lot of things going on at home, you know, in life, oh, yeah. just in her own mind. And, and, and I think that's the thing is it's not cut and dry, stop the bullying and, and this is going to happen. Um, no, I mean, you know, some, sometimes mental illness comes in and then it's going to take a little work to get it out. Yeah. A lot of kids uh, have a lot going on. I tell you yeah. what, more things to deal with than I ever thought I did when I was in high I tell you, I, I can't imagine. I think, I think it's very hard to be uh, a young person today. And I think at least where I am here in DC, it's so competitive. It's just so oh, yeah. terribly competitive. And I'm, I'm, I'm honored to say I, you know, I have one one boy who's I know is going to breeze through college, and I have one that it didn't work out, and he's now, you know, an EMT at a hospital saving lives. Right. And you know what? He didn't need college for that. He needed a certification, and that's the thing is there's something for everybody. You know, it's it's important to remember. You know, that that was his skill. His skill is people and first aid. Right. Those were his skills, and yeah. and that we need those you know, things, right? And, and you do. I mean, he, he is he is beloved in the hospital because he has a demeanor about him, and I just I always think about that. I'm like, you know, we were so pressured to put him into college instead of, you know, finally at at 21 he said, "This is what I want to do, Dad." And I'm like, "Go for it." You know, yeah, kids are you under so do. they're under so much pressure to achieve these days, whether it's reading about your test scores in the papers or whatever it might be, you know, and schools are under pressure to raise test scores and all that. But, you know, when I was going to school, you just went to school. <laughs> yeah, there was the no. assumption was you did your best. And if you did your best, then okay, great. And, uh, yeah. and now it's like, you got to keep up with everybody. And, you know, and, and as, I don't know, we could have a whole nother discussion about oh, yeah. the pressures of uh, modern day society and, and, you know, what parents kind of, Push yeah. the kids into doing, thinking that, you know, the kid is a reflection of the parent in what they achieve. And they're like, no, they're not. If they end up being happy and, and they have a career that they love, then you've done a great job, Mom. 
Just leave exactly. it. Exactly. You know? and, and you gave them the freedom to make decisions. It's funny. I have a, I have a mentor that, that wrote an article that I thought was brilliant, and it's called The Blessings of the B-Minus. And yeah, his point is B minus is the is the grade above C, right? C is average, so your your kid is above average at B minus, and that people aren't happy. You know, it's like the kid's not happy with a B minus, the parents not happy. Yeah, and, and the point is it it's a good thing, and we've made it into this other thing. You know, they're not failing, they're not getting a D, they didn't even get a C. Right. You know, and, and and it's just because of that competitive edge that it's like, oh, you know, that, that can't be, you know, it's got to be a, a minus or a, a B plus or and and honestly, I, I never thought about those things. I mean, I got I got good grades. I had a good average, but, you know, it wasn't it wasn't my whole day. My whole day was filled with theater and doing other creative things and working a job and learning about sort of life in general at jobs and <laughs> right. and what you'd never want to do again you know? yeah yeah I mean, fast food or something it's like no i need the education because of this <laughs> right <laughs> yeah you know, there are those jobs out there and i'm not cutting on anyone who has them but you know if if you don't want to do that your whole life then you know education is a path and and other things but but i i think that that experience is something that that not all kids get today i know my my two didn't they were so busy with activities and I had them doing all this stuff that, you know, they did very little work. You know, they didn't have to work under some, my older son did, but right. some oppressive boss, boss as a teenager, as we all did, or do outdoor work in the summer, which <laughs> we all probably did. Right. <laughs> no. So, so I have one last question I like to ask my guests and then I want, I want you to tell people how they can get in touch with you, get your book and all that. Sure. Um, so since we're called Healthy You, my question to you is, personally, what changes have you made in your life to live a happier and healthier life now that you weren't doing before? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I retired uh, back in '09, and so I kind of had to, uh, you know, think about those things. I mean, I've always been active, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's not like I had to make a lot of changes. I mean, I'm either out, you know, hiking or going diving or doing something. My mom has always said that I cannot sit still, <laughs> which, uh, which is kind of true, which is, you know, I'll be, if I'm working on one project, then that's kind of rare. It's usually two or three going on at the same time. And so in that sense, I haven't had to change a lot, but I, I have to focus more on, uh, you know, getting out and exercising and all that, you know, kind of sometimes in writing world, you can end up sitting around too much. Oh, yeah. And uh, so you have to consciously get out and do things. And uh, but I don't have to worry about that too terribly much. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I think, you know, healthy is not just your physical, it's the mental part. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so uh, in that sense, you know, still sp speaking to schools and writing and and all that I do in, in that world uh, has, you know, luckily I, I had something to do after I retired to keep my mind uh, engaged. And so at whatever age people are, <clears throat> I think that it's important to have uh, projects that challenge you mm -hmm. and so that you're always trying to be a better you. Mm -hmm. uh, because in my writing and everything that I do, whether it's painting, writing, even diving, it's like, how can I, uh, I, I want to get better at it. And so, you know, that's just kind of the competitive nature of me. You know, it's not like I'm trying to get better than anybody else. I'm just trying to, to kind of, I'm always competing with myself to see if, uh, if I can do a little bit better. And, and it's hard, you know, uh, to, to kind of keep that fire going sometimes. Yeah. Well, uh, well, part of it is always realizing like perfection is always one th one step away. You're never, right. you're never going to get there. So you, you continue to work and you look at, you look at things as, as, um, practice, right? You know, I'm always practicing. Yeah. I think Michael, Michael Jordan was famous for saying that, you know, they're like, how, how do you stay so cool? He's like, if I'm at practice, I'm practicing. If I'm, shooting a game I'm practicing I don't change right you know I don't do one lazily and one actively I, I I look for opportunities 
to excel and get better. Right. And it, I think it's important. That's it. I think that was a great, a great statement for everybody. So, so thanks for that. Yeah. So how can, how, how can people something find... that's really oh. helped me a lot is, uh, you know, like for Diane and I having been teachers, the book and the movie have given us a bigger platform. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when you're teaching, you can make changes and affect the lives of the kids that are right there in front of your face. But when you write a book, it, it changes the lives of people you'll never meet. And yeah. and so in that sense, you know, we're still teaching and we're still impacting people. And uh, and so that part has been, you know, once I kind of realized that, I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. And uh, so to be able to go around and you know, just talk to kids and whatnot like that is, I mean, I, uh, once a teacher, always a teacher, I think. And, uh, well, so yeah, I, say, I think that, yeah, it's, 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 that part has been great. Yeah. I, I think those of us, those of us who, whether we mentor, teach, coach, you, you can't ever give it up. It's, 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 it's ingrained in you because you want to see people get better. You want to, you know, my goal is to, you know, always to make someone a better a better version of themselves when they, right. when they want when they need it. So I think that's just part of what we do. And I think that's that's so true of kids. You know, I get so tired of hearing the comment of "Oh, this generation of kids, this and that." And I'm like, you know, I mean, all the kids that I taught, ninety eight percent of them were wonderful, and they yeah. want to do better. You know, sometimes you have to just give them a nudge in the right direction. But uh, nobody says, "Hey, I want to grow up and be a lazy bum." No, they all they all want to do right, and uh, you know you're talking about the empathy thing and all that. They they care about people. We've just got yeah. to we've got to we've got to help them get there because there's so many more things in front of their face now than it was 25 years ago. That to make sure they see what the important things are is probably a bigger task. But kids are just as amazing as they always have been. And I always think that the next generation is our next greatest generation. Uh, well, and, and it has to be, right? You know, we can't, if, if not, we're done. <laughs> if you don't think that, then uh, it's depressing. And you yeah. know, So why not tell a kid, you are the next great generation and, yep. and give them a reason to, to believe that. And and they will and they and they will you know and they will be um, yes. and and I think everybody does it every generation does it. What's wrong with the kids today? You know, it is it's so easy to fall into that trap because you don't think like that anymore. You don't think like a young person anymore. But you know, we were all there, and and those of us that can do some recall once in a while, or people who are around the the kids like you are. You realize, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with with them at all. Right. The the potential is there. You know, yep. you'll ruin it if you continue to tell them that they don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> That's where the problem is. Really? So, so how can people get in touch with you, Mike? How can people, uh, you know, find out more about what you're up to? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, the book is out there in all kind of places. Uh, you just look up the Fat Boy Chronicles on Amazon or wherever your favorite place is. And, uh, you know, they can write me if they want me to come talk to their school, if they want to set up a screening of the movie, if they want to buy books, I can, you know, hook them up with our publisher. Our publisher loves schools. I give like school discounts and things like that. Uh, they could write me at Mike at tinroofilms.com. And, uh, you know, they can look that up. They can go through the fatboychronicles.com. And there's a lot of great resources for kids, teachers, parents, uh, things like that on there. And, um, so, you know, but easily, I don't know if they're the, if you have access to putting my email. On. Oh, I will. Yeah. All, all those links will be on the, with the podcast on okay. building recovery.org. So, um, yeah, all, everything, everything you just mentioned will be there. So easy access oh, and, uh, from, from the podcast. Okay. And for teachers, there's, uh, there's two curriculum guides that go with the book and the movie. And so there's a lot of school systems where it's required reading. And so, you know, they just, you know, everything's already set. If a teacher wants to utilize the book and its message, and and uh, then everything is in place to uh, to make it happen. Great, great. Well, thank thank you. I mean, I mean this, and and I don't say it to every guest. I, you know, it was an honor to get have you on the show. Thanks. I I, I really it, it was an honor to get to talk to you, and 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 honestly, it, it's refreshing to have be able to 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 meet someone 
who is as, as involved as I feel I am, but also just you're you're a good person and and I really enjoyed uh, our time together that we got to talk and I, I look forward to more of that. I hope you know, yes, you'll continue to talk to me and and we can continue to work together um, again on the issue of bullying. It's so important. Right. Um, yeah. No. Thank you so much for the invitation and. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was a pleasure to meet you and, and uh, to learn about all that you're doing. And uh, and I know that what you're doing is so important uh, that that part of the uh, equation sometimes gets left out. And mm-hmm. so, uh, yeah, I mean, this was a great conversation and hopefully it'll uh, help some people uh, as they move forward in their own journey, whether it's kids, teachers, parents, whatever. Well, thank thank you for your time, Mike. Um, I I look forward to continuing to talk to you. This is Alan Eisenberg uh, with Healthy You. I hope you'll join us next time. Thank you for listening to Healthy University, brought to you by Bullying Recovery, LLC. This podcast does not replace the need for medical advice, professional diagnosis, opinion, treatment, or services to you or any other individual. The information provided here or through linkages to other sites is not a substitute for medical or professional care, and you should not use the information in place of a visit, call, consultation, or the advice of your physician or other healthcare provider. Join us next time for more Healthy University.